button. There we go. So over to you, Gav. Thank you very much. Uh, well, yeah, thanks, everyone. Um, it's been a while since uh, I've tied for you. Uh, I think it was back in February, actually, so pre-season. So it was kind of nice, really, that um, I'm tying with the last, what, nine days to go in, in Wales, anyway, uh, certainly for river trout. Um, so for those who, who don't know me, um, uh, I've been a guide over the years. I did 10 years stint for that, for my sins. Um, still a still a gas casting instructor, but very light on that at the moment. But I'm um, still very much uh, in the scene, as as you'd say. Um, so I'm going to focus today on the last session was on uh, early season trout fishing. Um, I am a through and through trout guy. Um, I do fish for grayling now and again through the winter, but um, mainly I, I can tend to these days. I get out maybe you know three four times a, a winter season for grayling, but um, really trout and the dry fly especially is 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 my love. Um, and and on that you know I'm I'm kind of a relaxed kind of fisherman. Um, if I need to wait, I'll wait. Generally, I will. Um, if there's for those who do know me, um, I'm quite happy to sit in the bank and have a beer um, and just wait and watch. And and more often than not, as I've said before, you'll you'll pick up or you'll spot a couple of um, rising trout. Um, certainly with the weather we've had on and off, um, you know the the hatches of they might be all day, but then the feeding um, trout might be constrained to maybe uh, you know a couple of hours here, there, and everywhere. So waiting and watching is generally my key. But today I thought, and I think I've talked on talked about this uh, a couple of years back for, for you guys, actually, back in 21. Um, and this is really around small stream fishing. So again, this is another big, big passion of mine. I kind of cut my teeth uh, in the valleys of South Wales. Um, we've got little streams, feeders, tributaries, spawning rivers, wh whatever you want to call them. They can be classed as small rivers, but generally they are the, you know, the tribs that feed the bigger main stems. Um, and on those waters, we one, we don't see that much um, of footfall compared to the main stems, mainly because they're a bugger to get into, right? And out of um, a couple of waters I fish, um, they, they're quite, you know, being a, a South Wales valley, they, they, they're quite steep, right? So the, 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 the angles of the valley there and the contours of the valley are, are quite, quite aggressive, really. So... It can be, it's a bit of a hike in, which I love. Um, winter comes around and one of the main reasons I don't do a lot of fishing is because I switch to mountains uh, and I'm generally hiking off and yeah, the ice axes are, are hanging up by the side of me. So hopefully we'll have some snow this year. So I like that. I like the adventure of it. Um, kind of like the the fact that, you know, you, you're fishing water that, you know, I'm not going to be um, naive enough to say that, you know, it's, it's virgin water, but on the flip side, it, it is generally um i wouldn't say untouched but it's lightly fish certainly the the small streams i fish um one of the good things um in sort of wales is the wire ask foundation or certainly the the southern part of wales anyway um they hold uh i think they do a small stream permit per year which is about 100 used to be 120 quid something like that i don't know what it is these days but it's about 120 to 140 quid these days probably and that gives you just as the as it states right a passport of stupid number of beats um some are fished more than others normally because the parking and the access is a bit easier um but i tend to fish the ones that you know you can see the cash returns online you can see how many people have booked um and generally if, if somebody hasn't been there for a month or two sometimes no one's fished it in a year so i'm like quids in so uh, it's great some of those are generally as i say quite hard hard to get into um but generally the reward is just it can be phenomenal right not not that i'm a numbers guy by by far for those who know me it's 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 not about that but the fact that you're fishing for these truly wild fish that potentially have never been caught before um kind of puts you in this kind of environment where you think you're in the middle of nowhere right which um which is it's which is what i love so um I've got a couple of pictures to show first. So we've got about a couple of hours tonight. Um, I'll try and do five flies, but what I'm kind of, the theme again, for anyone who's seen me tie either here or at a show or um, in person, whatever, um, is 
simplicity, right? So I was kind of uh, strangely accused of uh, uh, complicating my fly tying recently, um, which I I thought was a bit uh, shocking because um, my whole thing, my whole ethos of life, right, is keep things simple. Um, I don't particularly like headaches, like probably everyone on the call. Um, we all like an easy life. Um, and my focus is is the fishing, right, is the trout. So if I can make sure that my flies are uh, generalistic, so again, I keep coming around to this um, GIS, right, or um, G-I-S-S, so general impression of shape and size. So a facsimile of what's on the water, it doesn't need to be a, an exact replica. Um, it, as long as it's the footprint is around about the right size, the, the silhouette is, is around about the same size-ish. Um, that, that's what I look for personally. So we're not looking to really imitate an invertebrate, you know, to the nth degree. I'm not going to count the number of legs or, you know, that sort of stuff. That's, I don't know, that's just not for me. I like to do that now and again. It's, it's fun to do for shows and things like that. But at the end of the day, when it comes to fishing, um, you know, general impression of shape and size. Nice, nice and simple, right? Can't, can't get any easier than that. Um, so... Yeah, so yeah, being, being told I was a, a complicated tire made me laugh out loud, actually. I lolled, as they say. So um, I'll just share my screen a second um, because I kind of want to show you. It's nice saying that, yeah, I fish small streams, but what, what, what does that mean? What do they look like? So some of you I know um, well, and I know you've got access to awesome waters. Um, Kind of similar to to this, right? Um, Derek, are you able to give me access to share? Mate, is that okay? Yeah, because I can't share at the moment. Share screen. And I've got some nice pictures that I've taken over the years. There you go. Uh, no, you're sharing. I think I can see a nice Harley Davidson. Oh, well, we're done now. Stop share. How do I how do I do I click on a little arrow? Um I think it's like uh if you're hosting, I think there's normally it might be up the top, um, but it might try be that. like a host try option. That. Try, try now. That. Yeah, that's cool. Got it. So hopefully, uh if I can get a thumbs up from somebody just to say you can see. All all we've got is a picture of you. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Might might take a second to come through. So um yeah, so this this one's of the Tafaken. Uh this comes off Penavan. I'm sure you all um you've all heard of uh Penavan, um highest peak in, in South Wales, a uh, bit of a baby peak really. The proper ones are up in North Wales, but uh, that's where I tend to go in winter. But um it's in a bit of a spate at the moment. He's, as you can see, he's kind of tea stained, but really that's what I love. Um if I know it there's been a little bit of rain or it's dropping. Fantastic. Um, like like any kind of river, right? You know, you're going to get things washed in and, and all that good stuff. Um, but this was a number of years back. Um, and the good thing with this piece of water is you can pretty much fish from. Uh, so the Taff has two Taffs, essentially, which converge in Merthyr Tidville, uh, which I'm sure some of you have heard of. Um, Iron centre of the world at one point was going to be the centre of all the, the capital of, uh, of Wales at one point. Um, and this is where I'm from. So you've got the Taff Echen, or, or the small Taff, and the Taff Vaur, which is large Taff, and they both converge uh, in Merthyr Tidville to form the Taff proper, right, which then goes out through Cardiff Bay. Um, the good thing of this, you can pretty much fish this from where it converges with the Taff Vaur, so in Merthyr Tidville, all the way up to pretty much, I wouldn't say the source, because then you're, you're fishing a, a little trickle coming out the side of a mountain, but you can fish it up to what we call Pont Stickett Dam, um, right up, it's in the park, it's in, it's in uh, Bracken Beacons National Park, uh, and you can fish all the way up. That's about, I don't know, seven miles. Uh, so it's a hell of a bit of footwork, uh, but there's a good pub at the top. So if you strategically place one car at the top, one at the bottom, you can fish all the way up, have a pint, and then drive down. Not, uh, I'm not saying uh, you should have a pint and drive, but, you know, one's fine. It's not like the old days with five and drive. So, again, fast, broken water. You can see probably from this picture alone, the gradient that we're talking about. So these are kind of fast flowing. They're generally quite steep. Um, both sides are generally, you know, you're kind of like sliding down. And so don't wear your best waders, for God's sake. Um, 
yeah, yeah I, I generally tend to pay, wear a pair of uh, brush cut up pads as well. So protects my knees and my shins because I'm generally keeping quite low. But you can see hopefully some of the, the terrain that we, we look for. Uh, the next one is a lowland small stream. So this, well, I say lowland, this is kind of coming down slightly. This is the uh, Sahawi. Uh, and again, it's another um, South Wales Valley. This this one's a couple of valleys over from, from Merthyr Tidville. So for those um, who know some of the valleys, the, the rivers that come down in South Wales, generally, it's like if you hold your hand up and put your fingers down, there's, you know, a finger for each valley, uh, all converging on Cardiff, essentially. Um, so this one's a couple of valleys over. You can see it's still got a gradient, uh, but you can see it's a little bit more open. But this one, you can see now we're starting to see it's quite enclosed or a little bit more enclosed. This is quite early season, this one, actually. I think it's, uh, it's probably May. There's all older there. That's that's in full bloom. But a couple of trees further up the valley, they... They haven't yet come into bloom. So you can get away and we'll talk about gear in a bit as well um, as to what rods I use as well there. So you can see that we, we can't, in this scenario, easily do an overhead cast because you've got stuff above. So again, we'll talk about some of the techniques there as well. Again, same river, further up the valley. Again, about the same time of year, you can see foliage is in, you know, it's just sprouted in, but you've, you've got some uh, trees there which are set to bloom as well. And you've got these pockets, right? Um, so can you see my mouse? Can you see my mouse moving? Yeah. Yeah. So really for the for the guys who like nymphing, uh, again, you can nymph this water as well. You've got the fast water there. Great. You've got this sort of plunge pool just at the head here. Then at the top here, this is what I kind of look for as the dry fly guy, right? So all this slack water, I know for a fact there are going to be trout in there. They're not going to be huge um, because they just don't get the volume of food that the main stems get. You know, if you think about the largest, larger rivers, so I fish predominantly in season, um, the river usk, that can be a lot wider. You can open your shoulders. There's less sort of trees overhead, or predominantly not, not many very trees uh, overhead, very many. Um, but with this now, you're starting to see that, you know, the smaller environments, um, smaller sort of areas where the trout lay. And a good friend of mine, uh, a long, long time ago, we used to do a lot of small stream fishing through the year. And he said, and which had stuck with me, anything the size of a, a dustbin lid, right, that looks like it could hold fish or a pool or a run, size of a dustbin lid, certainly the size of a car bonnet, stick a fly over it. So these, these fish can sometimes, you know, you, whereas I talk about looking for rising fish on main stems, I'm, I'm, I'm more sort of actively searching with my with my casting and my flies. So I, I kind of look for the same sort of areas. And this stuff obviously translates to the larger rivers because, you know, you can, you can expand this 10, 20, 30 times and you're on a main stem, but you're looking for these sort of disturbances that we all know will normally hold a trout. If it doesn't, then either somebody's walked through it before me, which, as I said, I kind of um, deviate away from, I kind of look for the quieter places, or there's, you know, there's a, some other reason, right? But generally, as long as the river is in health, then we're going to have some some lovely looking trout. Uh, right, this one, this is sort of north of Abergavenny. So for anybody who knows um, Yusk catchment, um, this is the Griny Vaur. So Granny Vower comes down off the mountains there. Um, and again, this this was early sort of, I can't remember what time of year this was. I think it was like February, maybe March. You can see these, these trees here have got a little bit of early uh, growth on them. Um, but this, there's a nice ridge walk just, uh, just, just out of shot, just above this. It's a hell of a climb, you, you know, breathing pretty hard by the time you get to the top of it. But you can see that even these waters, it's quite slabby at this point. So the food is a little bit more scarce, but there are trout there. So even in like January, February, where generally I hope for snow, because this is a good walk in the snow. Um, now and again, you'll see some um, trout rise in there as well. And of course, the smaller rivers, as you can imagine, um, will often be used where there's good gravel, for example. And you can see these pools here will hold good gravel um can be used sometimes for spawning trout and salmon um i won't get on to the salmon issue but um uh, it's unlikely that salmon will get up then these days but still 
um, Trout certainly will will hold and do hold, and I've seen them. And yeah, even even when there's snow on the ground, it's it's, it's fantastic. And this is about I don't know what's this. This is about a thousand feet in altitude, so it's not it's not high, but you know it's uh, it's it's up there. And of course, then you're, you're hitting um, another I don't know eight hundred foot climb to to get to the peak. So you can see these these rivers run. Now we talk about spawning fish as well. These are your traditional Welsh spate rivers, right? So uh, this probably doesn't hold a great deal of spawning trout because they do fluctuate in, in levels um, drastically. So one day it could be looking like it does. We could have some snow, we could have some rain. Um, we've all had some bad rain the last uh, week or so. Um, so this, I imagine at the moment, is roaring. Um, so again, that's just going to wash out those gravels and it's not, you know, any self-respecting trout is uh is not really gonna uh lay its offspring there so there we go so that's just another example uh this one is uh a couple of valleys over so this is uh the mono catchment um and i know one or two of you know the mono um this is the Honvi, um an awesome little little stream this is pretty much at the very top this is actually one of the wide speeds so again you can see the differs slightly we're now into sort of meadowland uh, almost uh, for those who have been in the area or like camping you've got Llantony Priory just down the road literally a couple of hundred yards um, but again you've got this pretty much unspoiled untouched um, water as well and hopefully um, coming across on the video you can see you've got this awesome little food lane all the way down and this is my mate Alex he's uh, prospecting for a uh, or rather spotted a rising fish just by this bit of farmland waste um this little bag thing here um and he caught it so yeah great stuff but you can see what alex is doing is keeping a low profile um because again these fish aren't used to seeing again that footfall of angling pressure so they don't know what we are other than a massive predator right or or something that they're not used to so again these things have evolved since the ice age right to be risk averse like massively um they are prey at the end of the day so um they understand that if they see something they don't recognize they're gonna bolt or go deep or just stop feeding right um but again so alex is doing the perfect thing here and it did work because again he uh netted a fish back it went good day uh another lowlands so this is right in the south uh this is near ogmore by sea uh for those who know it um a couple of miles um south you've got ogmore uh, bay and you've got the the awesome um uh, bays and and then sea down there and great stuff um but again th this you can see the overgrowth this gets very little angling pressure this is actually a club uh, uh and district this is the river Uweni. um and again you can see how things change slightly so this one has got um it's got some tumbling sort of pools but generally the gradient um of the of the land there is fairly conservative right it's fairly similar throughout um so you do get these longer slacker glacier glides as well which again brings it brings in its own challenge right so whereas the faster more tumbly water so you can see i'm stood in this break here i've just fished the the previous pool up to this break um that faster tumbly water you know you can get away with maybe uh you know a bigger fly um prospecting for trout rather than targeting them but i'm purposely waiting here prospecting and looking for rising fish in this run um and actually walking up this 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 section is a bit of a nightmare because again this is one of these pools that you put a foot in the wrong place and again it sends that bow wave up or bow wave rather um and again all of a sudden the entire pool just stops right it's just just infuriating so at that point i generally get out and just go to the next pool um, almost like frog frog lip. so uh yeah so you can see the the difference between the two and generally uh you can see a nice cigar there so i've just had a nice uh trout uh this was a couple of years back this we talk about small streams and i think instantly as as anglers we think that ah, you know it's a small little tributary it's only going to be small little wild brownies which it is for the most part but generally speaking they you know once a season you you'll hook into something that uh you know kind of gets your heart rate kind of um uh, <laughs> hitting emergency level sometimes certainly with me anyway so i when i sort of hike into these places i generally take um i've got my fishing pack there it's got a good size backpack on it uh, i've got a little travel 
camping hiking stove thing i've made a fresh coffee and i've i've just had the big fish i say the big fish it was a pound um but on a two weight seven foot six two eight that's a monster right so uh yeah i'm pretty happy here uh i've had a coffee uh i probably smoked that cigar took an hour but yeah the world was right um perfect and i i couldn't have hoped for more so i don't think i fished the next pool i think i i backed the car i was kind of done um <laughs> you know you kind of want to finish on a high sometimes and uh yeah that i did it was a good day so some of these trout then again you can see uh my little finger here um so by all means not a beast um but for its environment again some of these fish can be absolutely astounding right you can see the awesome blue eye shadow on this thing awesome red spots uh hopefully you can see the adipose fin there nice and red uh so these fish are really um quite happy quite healthy See a smaller one there, so less than the length of my hand. Um, again, uh, this is what we're generally targeting. Certainly, I'm targeting. Uh, but these things are absolutely pristine, right? You know, uh, I catch some lovely, lovely fish on um, on the usk, for example. You know, fin perfect, photograph worthy. Stick them up on a wall. Um, the print that is not the you know I'd never dare take a, a wild fish, but um, yeah, you can see the quality of these of some of these fish. Now, this one was actually that fish I talked about. Um, so that's pushing a pound. Uh, and I, as I say, on a two eight, I yeah, I I think I screamed <laughs> actually because uh, it still does get me. I'm forty two. Uh, I've been fishing since I was ten, and uh, you know it still 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 gets me in in the right places, right? So this is uh, this is that fish from that pool, uh, and as you can um, agree, hopefully. Uh, that deserved a, a, a coffee and a, and a trout cigar. I think uh, it uh, it was well deserved. So each their own. That's my guilty pleasure. I like to have a couple of year, um, but that that deserved it. So in terms of uh, the fly life that we see, um, so that one of the streams there that I mentioned is Howie. Uh, I mentioned I'm from Merthyr, and that was a couple of valleys over. That gets a good hatch uh, early season of March Browns um like phenomenal like usk level march browns the only difference is this river takes quite a couple of months to warm up so really fishing there is it's quite cold it's quite rough still any sort of downpour of rain where the usk might you know withstand you know uh, you know a day or two of rain still fishable these rivers kind of tend to fluctuate very quickly right so again yeah, that, that time of year is still cold. The trout really ha haven't started looking up. So tonight I will cover one nymph. And uh, for those guys that know me on the call, uh, you'll probably chuckle because I don't think anybody ever sees me tie a nymph. So uh, again, I just like uh, dry fly fishing too much. The the very lowland uh, river I mentioned, the Ueni, um, so near Ogmo, this is um, has a fantastic hatch of mayfly. It's actually classed in areas as a chalk stream. Um, and there's not, I don't think there's many that I can count on one hand in South Wales, or Wales even. Um, but this does have belts of chalk running through it. Um, and the fly life there is just phenomenal in it, on its day, right? But generally every year we'll get a good hatch of, of mayfly, proper Danica. Uh, you can see this done here has just come off. Uh, the size of the shuck was just crazy. These things down there are like um, budgies. That's my middle finger, just for just for reference. Um, so you know, not no small fly. So we do get uh, a good range there. Caddis, yeah, I love caddis. I I kind of it's my kind of go to. Once the season has woken up um, and we're in to June, maybe. I kind of tend to focus on fishing caddis imitations um, from there on out. As I say, the, the trout there are very opportunistic. They don't get a lot of food. So when they see something that maybe resembles food, or certainly something drifts past them in a place where they know food would drift, as long as there's no drag and I haven't spooked them and I haven't stood up or I haven't you know, fallen over into a pool, which I do now and again, by the way, um, then generally a uh, caddis is my kind of go-to kind of pattern right but again it's buoyant and we'll come on to the flies in a minute buoyant it's visible i'm not casting far i'm only casting maybe maximum two rod lengths away because i personally see and certainly this is the way i taught it is and this this goes for the the larger main stems as well right if you can get into a position and present your your food imitation in a place where uh, a trout would expect to see food without spooking them 
you've done your job. So this is why I wear those brush cutter knee pads, shin pad things, because most of the time I'm on my knees, right? And if I'm fishing a couple of mile stretch of water, I bloody feel it afterwards. So I've hiked in, I've pretty much crawled up two miles of river or stream, uh, and then I've hiked back to the car. Um, so it feels like I've been to the gym. And I don't go to the gym, but I imagine that's what it feels like. So uh, there we are. Uh, we also get midge, but to be honest, I, I don't. So again, for those who know me, when I fish the main stem, I love midge fishing, right? Because there's billions of them around. They're there all year, and the trout know exactly what they look like. Um, but on a small stream, again, opportunistic trout, um, they will take, you know, again, food. If there's if there's a run or an area of water where food can get trapped or drift by, then they'll take it. Again, these things are quite small or midge imitations. Certainly my midge imitations for uh, the USK generally start about big ones are 16. Generally, I'm fishing 18s, 20s. And, you know, the years we've had of warmer climate um lower waters yeah you know, you, you're fishing smaller things right just to make it look more natural so again it's not unknown for me to fish 24s i don't really tend to mess around with 26s anymore my you'll notice i chuck a pair of glasses on now tie flies and again threading some of these smaller things is um is is not fun when when you're out so again sign of maybe uh, we do get terrestrials, uh, so this one's a bibio, a hawthorn fly, whatever we want to call it. Again, um, depending on, we do get a lot of those kind of um, nasty, scraggly, thorny, um, blackthorn, hawthorn, um, bushes, trees uh, along these rivers. Uh, they're just, you know, they, they, these are kind of hardy brash rivers, right? And likewise, the, the trout, uh, you know, um, imitate their environment, and certainly the trees do as well. So again, uh, we do get the odd um, option or, or, or scenario where we can fish uh, terrestrials as well. So what we'll cover tonight, uh, I think you've seen me tie one or two of these in the past, but we'll cover them because they are very appropriate um, for this style of fishing that I do. So CDC and elk, simple pattern. So for anybody who wants to call me a convoluted um tire <laughs> uh no there's two patterns there's two two ingredients there as the name suggests cdc and elk or as i tie it um as per um hans weilenman um who was the creator of this fly uh with deer hair and again you can get patches of deer hair for next to nothing and generally good quality so again you can bash out these it's a guide fly right i've i've, I've seen um, a couple of conversations in the WhatsApp group recently uh, and on the Facebook pages, uh, guide flies, right? These things are, are, well, yeah, pretty much bottom proof and they're tied, right? And to be fair, if you tie a fly that takes, what, I don't know, a minute, then uh, you don't mind as much if it gets caught in a branch. And again, that will happen. If you don't lose a couple of flies when you're fishing a small stream that's overgrown um, in the height of July um, to a tree, then, yeah, you're not really pushing yourself to put the flies where the trout are. Right? I think it was in River Runs Through It or something where uh, it's not in the film, but it's in the book where um, Paul McLean says something like, you know, you need to you need to put your, your flies where the where the trout are. And uh, that's absolutely true. Um, so expect to lose one or two. Clean camera, uh, we'll cover tonight as well. Just this is a brilliant fly, not just in its own right, because the, the, the its ability to pull fish up is immense. I don't know what it is, Again, Hans Van Klinken came up with this fly in the 80s uh, to, um, uh, to imitate uh, a caddis. Uh, again, you can tie it in a host of colors. Again, we'll keep it simple tonight, so I'm not going to bother with a rib. But again, we'll just show you the process of, of tying this, this fly. And the good thing, remember, with this is you can be fishing that on a, a glassy, smoother run. But then the next pool, which is only like, what, 10 foot away, could be more broken could be deeper and the best thing or the easiest thing to do is if nothing's rising in in that top foot uh, of of water then you can simply tie on a foot or more of tippet directly to the hook shank and then stick a nymph on underneath so hence why i'm going to tie a nymph as well so again you, you can see the flexibility of of this pattern because one it's it's highly buoyant highly visible because of the the post that you know the array of colors that we've got available to us these days and again if that were to dip, or rather, if I had a, um, a nymph tied underneath and this was to dip or deviate or nudge, then again, could be a rock, right? But generally, 
Um, as long as I've not spooked them again, then again, it, you know, use it as an indicator as well. You can use a bobber or um, one of these bits of wool or whatever. Um, but, you know, um, each to the, you know, fish the water. Uh, the one water that I mentioned, one of the previous rules, they changed it now, but it was only ever single fly upstream. So you could fish nymphs, but that meant you couldn't fish uh, under a clean camera, for example. You couldn't fish the duo, New Zealand style, whatever we want to call it. Um, so that pushed us a little bit to to learn about, you know, maybe greasing your tippet or tying a bit of wool on or, or whatever. Uh, but that rule's changed now. So yeah, there we are. So if I do have a hard day, um, and I kind of like catching fish, right? I've said I'm not a numbers guy, but I also like catching fish at the end of the day. Um, you can you can use this as an indicator in its own right. But then if the fishing gets good and you've got fish coming up to the clink hammer as well, or more so to the clink, you, you've got the option there to snip off the nymph nice and easy. This is another good one. Um, so this is a, a direct or uh, the animal Scandinavian fly. Uh, you can see, again, this is going to be, it's going to be like a cork, right? Deer hair right through it. You've got hackle as well, which which I grease up, grease the tail, grease the hackle. And generally I tie them quite bright on the body, um, just more as an indicator. Uh, again, if they're lighter in color, then you can kind of generally work out where they are. But if I'm fishing faster, more broken water with a lot of white flecks and a lot of um, turbulence in the water, then I find the orange can help sometimes. But generally if I'm fishing faster, you know, really broken water, I'll, you know, go back to, uh, Go back to the clink hammer. This thing is like a, a flare coming down the river sometimes. So again, we'll, we'll take a quick look at that. Um, and what's next? My arrow's gone. I think that was it. So they're the, the sort of three dry flies. Um, if I've got time, uh, we'll certainly cover the nymph, but we'll also cover maybe a terrestrial. Not that I use them that much, but I've talked about them. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll maybe uh, touch on that as well. So any questions so far? It's pretty much... Uh, where I fish, the fish in them, uh, the invertebrates we have, and some of the flies we're going to tie tonight. They're all on mute at the moment. So if anybody wants to ask a question, unmute yourself, ask it, and then mute yourself again, please. Yeah, we'll make uh, make this a two-way conversation this evening. Um, again, I'm not a not a talk at you. I'll, I'll talk with you, right? So, uh, so there we go. So. Um, Cool, let me switch my camera. Hopefully I've set this up right. So let me know, can I get a thumbs up somebody? Can you see Hello, my good, um... yeah. Cool, okay. Um, so we'll start with uh, the clink camera. Um, and again, so I'm using a, um, and again, if this goes out of focus a little bit, right, tell me and I'll just I'll just uh, zoom zoom in a bit. Um, so again, what, what we're trying to do, this is gonna be a, um, Caddis imitation, ideally, right? So you can see the, the the length of the hook is is you know one or two x plus compared to a, a standard sort of dry fly. Um, there's loads of patterns on the market. Uh, there's well, there's the aptly named partridge clink hammer hook. Uh, they also do an extreme version, which I take my scissors from about there up to the eye is is sort of bent, right? So it, you know the the actual body will sit more at an extreme angle where the, the the thorax then will come in more more horizontal. So again, you've got the options there. Or you can just buy the normal ones uh, if the others are out of stock and you can just take your um, forceps, which I'll do now, and we'll just do a slight bend. If you want to, you haven't got to, all right? It doesn't really um, hurt the hook much, but it just gives a nicer profile and it allows the body to punch it or punch it through uh, the surface a little bit easier, right? Because, and let it hang. So a couple of things we're going to use for this. Um, we just jump back. So good hackle, right? Uh, any hackled um, parachute fly is nothing without a hackle. I'm uh, a whiting nerd, so I love what they do. Um, they do an array of good stuff. Um, some people say it's expensive. Mm, it's subjective. Um, personally, I think it's an investment. Or certainly, that's what I tell uh, everybody I, I I fish with. And yeah, it's good quality, right? So we all, you know, use use the tools that we uh, are available to us and where we can. Um, so that's that's the key where where we can use use as good uh, material as as is available to you and is is 
you know, within budget at the end of the day. But generally, um, the good thing these days is there's so many awesome manufacturers that are doing so high quality stuff. It's pretty much like beer these days. It's hard to find a bad one, right? Um, well, certainly that's what I tell myself. So um, it's generally good stuff, okay? So we'll just go back to uh, the hook then. Um, so there's a way, certainly that I tie, um, it's a little different from Hans Van Klinken's. He kind of incorporates the, the post into the body, which you can do, um, but I've kind of got trapped in the way I, I, I tie it now. So um, first of all, then, I'm just going to go on with my um, thread. Uh, and for this, um, well, for all my tying, really, I use Semplify, um Nano silk, right? Because it's, it's bomb proof and it's, you know, any any thread that can cut my hand because it's so bloody strong is uh, is a go to for me. So I'm just going to lay a base there and I'll tell you for why in a minute. Right. So you can see I've, I've bent this, right? So I've kind of, you can see how it'll build up this thread has got. Um, it's once down, once back up, essentially. Uh, and you, you can hardly see it, right? Um, so again, it's it's very strong, very low profile or, or low bulk. And then what I've got is, um, you, and again, is a, an array of materials you can use for this. And um, bear with me. So you've got your, uh, if you can see that, you've got your TMC AeroDry, which is becoming a little bit more harder to find. But again, you can see the color on that is is fairly uh, in your face, as we say. Uh, or you've got um, something like uh, this poly on, uh, if I zoom in. So again, this is multi-stranded, uh, and this is the, oh, there you go, poly on. <laughs> nice and simple, right? Uh, again, range of colors. Um, it is buoyant, but again, this is above the surface, right? We're not using this as, as that buoyancy aid. It's the hackle that gives us that buoyancy, right? So remember that when you're, when you're spending your hard-earned cash. Um, you could use CDC if you wanted to. Uh, that comes in an array of colors. But again, we just want it as a site. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to, hopefully you can see that. I've just taken two strands. All right. So you can see the two there. And I'm just going to just going to move that. So I'm not going to tie over it, but I'm just going to move it and park it on top. And the bobbin is just hanging there. It's just going to hold it in place, hopefully. So let me just use my finger just to hold it. And I'm just going to do a loose wrap over the top. I'm just going to make sure that's in the place that I want the, the bottom of the butt or the base of the post to, to be, right? And then once I'm happy with it, um, I'll just do a couple of firm wraps and I'm happy, okay? Now, two sections of the poly on, all right, which I'm going to actually fold up, all right? So effectively, we're using four strands, okay? Now, what Hans Van Klinken does is take the four strands, essentially, and ties them in kind of like that, right? So you can imagine the butt ends are going back down, and he'll cut a taper and use that. But I, I kind of like this way. This was shown to me by somebody else, and it's just another way of doing it, right? There's no right or wrong. Uh, this just this is this is one that works for me. So I've done about three wraps over, and again, you can see the little buildup because of the thread I'm using. And I'm just going to take my thread. I'm going to take it behind. All right, which is going to naturally just kick that up straight away. And then I'm going to take all of the pieces and excuse me if my the angle of the camera is off slightly. Just going to do a couple of wraps front and behind. All right, so that's going to start to make those stand upright. And then I'm going to do touch and turns up the post. So hopefully the camera's set up okay so you can see this. So I'll, I'll again, I'll, I'll put it back to the camera in a second uh, so you can see properly. So again, what, what I'm trying to do here is, so I work in IT, right? <laughs> again, for my sins. Um, so I'm a, I'm a very logical thinker, I think. So again, each one of these phases lends itself to strengthening the next phase. So again, if you start weak uh, or if you don't get one phase right, then yeah, you can tie the next phase, that's fine. But again, it's all, keep things simple, right? So again, if you can start strong, it's only gonna help you on the next phase, which is gonna be the hackle, right? So we'll get to that in a moment. So again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of wrap up uh, about the sort of height of what the thorax length is, okay? So again, touching turns up, 
And then yeah, you can do touching things down if you want or open whatever you want to do. And again, I'm just going to build that base. Hopefully you can see we've got a good, strong um, post, but because the way I've tied it in at the moment, this can go left and right. It can go around the hook shank. That's just part of the, maybe the makeup of the material, the, 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 the thread I'm using. Nano silk or gel spun, whatever we want to call it, can be quite slippery by nature. But again, it's about knowing your tools and um, we can just sort that by we'll do tight wraps in front and behind. So think like your, your bookends, right? Uh, you, you're just forcing pressure in front and behind. So this isn't going to go anywhere. We don't want it to wrap around. We don't want it to slide back or forward. Um, that is good and then i'm just going to strengthen that further and i'm just going to create a taper um, in front and behind and again i'm really accentuating those sort of bookends if we think about that all right yeah um in in that moment when you told us like uh the post will slip around the hook shank my first rep would be uh my my glue you know yeah you can use glue yeah absolutely um there's a couple of guys that um, will do what i'm doing to a degree and then um i can't remember the chap's name uh, but he swore by it um i've never tried it because this just works i don't personally i don't think you need it but what you can do is take your bodkin and essentially yeah dip it in your varnish or your um super glue whatever you want and actually just dip into so you'll actually go into the the base and that'll just suck down through the base uh, or through the post and it'll just lock it tight um yeah so yeah absolutely alice yeah, that, yeah no no don't, don't don't get me wrong i'm, I'm just like uh, okay this is another way to do it a bit more uh eco-friendly i'd say yeah i suppose yeah of and course again, it's, it's it's an option as well because uh, if you if you uh put on less weight i mean like threat is a bit uh a bit less heavier than than hmm. glue, i guess uh, yeah and you're more eco-friendly why shouldn't we do it like you do you know yeah and again that's that's the great thing right suppose you got the option um so yeah you could do I mean, there are a lot of um varnishes now which are quite flexible when they dry so that's re that's really good whereas some glues as you know like su like super glue for example that can go quite brittle when it gets cold or wet or or, or when it dries so again yeah you know if, if you can do without a material um it's up to you if you want to use it or not but absolutely yeah if you you want to try that um just to lock that dead tight absolutely you've got the you've got the option there great thanks cool let me zoom a little bit so there we go so you can see i've got a bit of a, a taper going on in front and behind so that's going to form our thorax when we get to it um but i've got a bit of a drop here at the, at the base there but we we're gonna we're gonna sort that out in a minute because we're gonna put a hackle in so i've got um uh, rooster hackle so again this one's grizzle um this is a whiting from a whiting cape specifically a bronze so i'm just going to prep uh the base i'm just going to get rid of the the fluffy bits a second so bear with me um, almost there so what we're looking for um this hackle ideally should be about uh the length of the body right either about the length or just past or that's that's pretty much bang on right you can go longer if you want again if you've got really fast broken water and you really need like more of a footprint to um suspend this fly maybe you're fishing nymphs underneath it could be a heavier nymph for a heavier pool um then again um you know you've, you've got the option there to um use a hackle which is appropriate for what you're going to be fishing water wise Again, if I'm fishing slacker water, then I'm not too worried. But if I'm fishing faster, it's always worth having a few really densely hackled um, flies in your box. All right, it gives you the option. So uh, this is a personal thing. Uh, hopefully, you can see the hackle there. What I've done is this side, or rather the other side. Sorry. So this side, uh, you can see what I've done is stripped off a couple of the the bottom hackles. So this is going to be the leading side when I come to tie it in, and you'll see that at the very end. Um, that allows, so when you're you're wrapping around, I'm not going to get any hackle fibers sticking directly up. And that's purely, um, you know, <laughs> a me thing, right? Um, it's not going to affect the buoyancy of the fly at all. 
but for me it's just a you know a, a nicer looking flight so again um you tie it your way so i'm just gonna you can't see this but i'm gonna tie it in uh, facing me and again the shiny side of the feather facing me the dull side is what's gonna when we tie it in is gonna face the sky the shiny side or the convex side is going to face the water, right? So almost like an upturned umbrella, right? So that the the curvature of this of this um, feather, like any feather, is is going to um, like an upturned umbrella, right? You can tie it the other way, but I don't know. I don't, don't tend to think they look as good, but buoyancy wise, it's not going to probably not going to have any effect, right? So I'm just going to do one loose wrap. Um, because what I want to do is, if you can see my needle point, this uh, hackle fiber here um, is, I want to kind of make sure that that's tied in just above the top wrap on the post. Um, so again, when we bend it down, we don't have any fibers sticking up. So what I'm going to do then is, again, touching turns straight up the post again. And stop at the top wrap that I've prepped previously, and then touch and turns again, all the way back down. Now, so is that, guys? Um, this one is a 14, but remember it's uh, it's like a 2X, right? So it's a longer body. So the gape is about 14, but the, the length of the hook, so it, there's my middle finger. So there you go, it's, uh, it's the length of my middle finger. This one's a 14, it's not uncommon for me on small proper turbulent waters to fish larger um because again as i say this this just brings fish up it's uh i don't know what it is but uh trout do do like it but this is a 14 um some of the patterns tonight are a little larger just for the camera but um yeah hopefully you can see where i'm going with it now you've got the option here to snip this bit off i don't um uh, two reasons one i'm going to incorporate this into the body all right, so I'm actually going to tie it down half uh, of the um, body, and that just helps me to start to create a taper, right? Um, so I'm going to snip it there. But also, uh, I don't know whether you can see that. So there's the other side of the fly. I know it's upside down. But that L shape of the, what are the, the rachis, the, the, the core of the fly, the feather itself, it, it's not going to pull out because we've got this L shape. We've locked it in. Um, you know, we've really made sure that that's not going anywhere. So technically that that feather will never pull out unless you've got, you know, a kind of an older cape or, or um, um, back or, or, or saddle, then um, it's going to be quite, um, it's going to be quite secure, right? So I'm just going to snip that off. And what we're going to do, usually what I do at this point is just move the hook slightly so that the abdomen is a little bit more horizontal. Just makes it a little bit easier to work with at, the, at that point, right? So I'm just gonna, just gonna take my time. I'm just gonna start to form a bit of a taper ever so slightly. And again, if you're using this 18 alt thread, which I use pretty much all the time, um, you need a couple of layers just to just to start to form that that taper. But again, I, I'm going to be using dubbing, right? So again, I can incorporate that into the into the into the carrot like um, body as well. So again, so that feather ain't going nowhere. Right. Got a lot of wraps there, so let me just one unwind that thread a little bit. Uh, right. So, yeah, you can use anything for this for this body, right? Um, I'm gonna use dubbing, as I say. It's easy to come by. It's cheap. It's generally good quality. Um, and there's a million colors. Not that I tend to deviate much color wise. Um, again, I I focus on that you know, general impression of shape and size. Um, and I don't worry too much about color. So I use a lot of drab sort of olives and browns and grays uh, and all that good stuff. Um, so this one's like a, this one is a hair's year mix with snowshoe. So what I'm looking to try and do, and I'll show you a little bit better in a minute. My dubbing noodle rope, whatever we want to call it, 
Um, I'm working this this front end. So if I hold that up, that side is is as tight as I can make it. And then the, the bit towards my bobbin is going to be a lot thicker. OK, so that again, what I'm trying to do here really is is um, create that taper. Not that a caddis really has a taper, but that's, that's another point. But what I'm trying to do is not put that much bulk at the, the butt end because I want that to puncture um, the water where it can. OK, so I'm just going to do a couple of wraps to start with and then I'm going to tease out the make it a little bit tighter. Again, don't don't worry. I, I you know, tried to start with as little dubbing as I can, and then if I need to add more, then I can. Okay. Again, it's a little bit harder to to take this stuff away. So again, I'm just going to wind as I go. I'm just checking that you know I've not got any lumps or big bumps. Or this is the bad thing about tying on a camera because you guys can normally see all the mistakes. There we go. Hopefully you can start to see there's a taper form in there. So again, that butt is going to cut, hopefully, uh, right through the surface, right? So again, I haven't got enough there, so that's fine. So I'll just take another pinch and again, I'll just dub that on. Again, I'm not too worried at this point now where I am on the body because I'll just uh, stick a bigger clump on and, and I'm not worried about it being too fine. Uh, so again, you'll see I'm turning my hook in the vise just to check all is well and a tiny bit more almost there and I'll take a tiny little bit more actually You go. Okay, so that's my body. Now you can see these these little bits of fluff hanging off. Talked about um, we want this to puncture the surface. So that's cool. If you want more of a footprint, um, fine, leave them on. What I tend to do personally, and again, this is only personal, right? Um, I like to make sure that that body pierces the, the surface film. So these bits are only going to stop that from happening. So what I'll do in a bit, you'll see I'll Turn the hook and I'll, I'll just give it a little bit of a haircut. Um, I think Ollie Edwards actually said that. And it's kind of stuck with me. So that's the way I kind of do it. But we'll come to that in a minute. But you can see there's some good some good bits hanging off there, right? And let's be honest, anything that's trying to break through a surface of the film is generally a mess of legs and bits and antennas and, and all sorts, right? They're not the sexy mayflies that we see. So you've got options there. And again, this is why I suppose some people like um, tying this style of fly with like either biots or stripped peacock curl. You know, they they form a really nice um, tight body that's, you know, it's never going to get trapped in the surface film. It's just going to cut straight through. So you've got options there as to what you use. But that's the flexibility of this fly, I suppose. Um, so we're almost done. So next, I'm gonna. You can use a, you can use dubbing for this as well if you want. Again, if we're talking about keeping things simple, um, you can use dubbing for that as well. But I, I like um, how the flash of um, peacock curl. So I take. So what I'm doing off camera is taking three strands of peacock curl. Can't get away from that. That's that's like lightning, right? It's like a again a flare. So I I, just, I like a bit of flash in in some flies, um, whereas the others are kind of you know drab looking. And much like the um, the post, what I'll do is go up and under. All right. So rather than tie it down again, you can just tie it in with another wrap if you want. If you're using you know sample fly style stuff, then it's not going to add any bulk. And what I'm doing, hopefully you can see the bits I've trimmed tight. They're behind the eye, right? So I'm just, again, just trying to make it easier for myself when I come to finish the fly. So I'm just going to do a loose wrap there, another loose wrap, and then I'll tighten down because, as we know, um, peacock curl can sometimes be a little bit brittle, but uh, we'll see. So this stuff is um, becoming a bit more of a talking point now um, in terms of sustainability and, and whatnot. So, again, I think in certainly the next five years, um, I can see... 
it's going the way of John Wilcott, maybe, but uh, we'll we'll see. So I'm just going to take one wrap over. Now, as you can imagine, right, as I said, this stuff can be brittle, right? So what I'll do, hopefully you can see that hurl turning. So what I'm doing is, is with my finger and thumb, I'm just twisting it. So effectively, we, we're creating a rope um, of twisted peacock hurls. So again, it's adding uh, more security to that. So when I get to the point where I've got a bit of a break um, at the top or, or the latter half of the thorax, I'm just wrapping it forward beyond the post, and then I'll come back and I'll start building that thorax. So hopefully you can see how nice and simple this one is. Sorry if you hit the camera, I'm a bit, uh, bit close tonight to the camera. And again, we'll just do a wrap over, just let it hang. And then a couple of tight turns, pull it all back. And then a couple of wraps behind the eye to secure. I'm just going to leave that there. Apologies if it's uh, in the lens. I'm just going to take my whip finish tool, or if you want to do it with your fingers, just going to do a whip finish there, pull tight. And I'm just going to start snipping. Right, so that's the body and thorax. Now, you might be thinking, Gar, you've taken your, taken your thread off and you've still got the feather there. What, what, what's going on with that? Um, so this is the way um, I like to tie it. I think... I think Hans Van Klinken does it this way. Um, but essentially, you, you, uh, what I want to do is not wrap the feather around and then tie it off behind the eye, because by doing that, you're going to be trapping down loads of those really um, posh chicken fibers, uh, which we want to use, as I said, for um, buoyancy, right? Um, so again, that's the body, that's the thorax. Um, I'm kind of done at this point. So again, what I'll show you now is, is how I tie this off. So I'm just going to turn this in the vise. I might need to move the camera a little bit. Hopefully that's still in focus. Um, and then I'm going to take my scissors. As I said, I kind of want to give this a bit of a haircut now because I want that butt to really puncture through the surface. So I'm just taking off the fibers. I'm not, I'm not cutting into the dubbing as such. I'm just taking off the uh, some of the, the spiky bits. On another kind of um, dry fly, I might want to keep those on, right? Um, but for this one, again, I want that, um, that abdomen to, to puncture where, where I can. Sarah, did you ever um, try to burn this fuzzy stuff? Uh... Uh, I, personally, uh, me and fire, not not so much. Um, I can make a good fire, but putting it out is another thing. So, um, no, uh, yeah, you could do. Um, how would you do it, Alice? With literally with a what, just a, a dab of a, a lighter, or yeah, I think so. Yeah, just a, a quick uh, a quick touch with the flame, you know. Yeah, for for me, uh, I would probably get that wrong. So I'd love to see that when you're yeah. over in February. I'm gonna come see yeah. you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll bring the lighter. You can you can do the burning. <laughs> it but, depends yeah. on the material, I guess. Huh? If it's uh, if it's fully synthetic, I think it would like melt away. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very quick. And uh, if it's natural stuff, uh, yeah, it would be like not that fast, but it will smell a bit heavier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But maybe it'll uh, just sizzle the tips, right? Or the, or the yeah. fizzy. That's that's cool. I mean, a flambe. Oh, tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On this one, yeah. Yeah, that 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 work. Um, so now that's done, I've kind of set myself up for the final the final dance, right? So the body's kind of done, the thorax is done, and I've prepped um, what I'm going to be using uh, as the post, right? So I'm going to take the same thread again. This is 18 alt. So remember, this post has got um, touch and turns up, and then touch and turns down. Then I've tied in a feather stalk or rachis. So that's added extra uh, bulk. I've tied that up and I've come back down. So that's four layers of uh, thread and a stalk or a rachis of uh, a feather. And now I'm going to add the fifth layer of um, uh, thread and I'm just going to wind from the top of the post down. Again, this is where, you know, these materials now are your friend, right? Because we're using really fine stuff. It's also very strong, but... Um, I'm not adding in terms of bulk to that. 
really, am I? You know, it's still probably about the same size ish, maybe a bit thicker than the the, the butt end, but it's pretty good. So I've tied in. I'm just going to let that hang. All right. Um, and now the the length of this feather is long enough so I can use my fingers. But what I'm going to do, so hopefully you can see that first wrap, as we mentioned earlier, there's no feathers sticking up. Again, this is just purely a cosmetic thing, right? And again, I just, you, you, we all know what it's like. If, if the flies in your box look nice, you kind of fish them with a bit more, I don't know, confidence almost sometimes. Um, so what we're looking, just in touching turns all the way down, that's three, that's four, that's four. Five. Are there any hackle fibers sticking down? Just take your feather uh, and go under them. Um, I'll move my camera when I'm finished in a second. But um, there's a kind of a, a little knack to this because a lot of people say, "Well, how many uh, how many turns do you use?" Well, again, if we go back to the the length of the post or the height of the post, I said it was the same length as the thorax, right? And that just gives you that uniformity, regardless of what fly um, or size of hook that you're going to use. So on this size 14, that thorax is about, I don't know, a quarter, would you say, of the length of the hook-ish, maybe a quarter to a third. Again, if you use the same ratio, you can tie these down to 20 odd uh, and still you know, keep that ratio. F finding a feather then is another challenge, but there we go. So people say how many turns? Well, it's not the number of turns, but it's touching turns of the feather uh, on that length or, yeah, the length of the post. But when to stop? So I don't know whether you can see this a bit. Yeah, it's a bit. So eventually, when you put too many turns on, this feather, because of the bulk underneath of the very bottom, will start to kick up the rest of the feathers, and that's not what we want. So I'll go so far. And then as soon as that starts to kick things up, I'll take a take a wrap off. And then I know, right, this is when I need to I need to tie off. So what I'm going to do with my feather, um, sorry, my thread, I don't want to uh, trap any um, hackle fibers down. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to, hopefully you can see I'm wiggling uh, my thread back and forth. So I'm working through the fibers. Yeah, so I'll just... Go through this one, two, then I'm going to take the, 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 the tip end and I'm going to bring it up and I'm going to do a wrap underneath it. And then I'm just going to park my thread. All right, nice and simple. Now at this point, um, you should be able to have enough tension on the thread so that you can go in with your snips and take the tip off. Now, at this point, you could use one of the sort of extended um hackle pliers but i don't have one of those i think i gave it away because i never used it so this is where um i would finish with your hand comes in handy so one two three i will use the hook of it just to hold it and then we'll go up and pull in not pull too tight because again this this thread will cut through it all so again and this is about knowing your tools i suppose just uh know how much pressure you can put on these things and then just go in with one side of the the scissors mine are extremely sharp and then just snip so we're almost done okay so let me just move the camera just once more uh, so let me just sort the hackle out so I don't know how that looks in terms of how that's coming across on the camera, but let me just sort my post out. That's nice, that Gareth. So essentially what we've got then is a, a really buoyant um, clink hammer. All right, so this is going to hold nymphs as well. Um, and then the last thing I want to do, I just want to take the post, give it a twist, and again, cut the post at an appropriate size now for this i tend to again for me personally if you look at and you can measure this with your, your scissor points um kind of the the length of the hackle fiber right so again you, you, you'll, you'll start to sort of see that right for the hackle i'm using but that's not to say that you know you can't have a higher or smaller hack uh, post if you're fishing really broken water again coming back to fishing the conditions right then again, if you want a longer post, this isn't giving us the buoyancy, it's giving us the visibility. 
Again, if you want longer or um, more condensed, compact, um, some people use two colors, that look kind of cool. Um, but again, just pink, orange um, works for me. White, if I'm fishing generally unbroken water, or if I'm fishing later in the day, maybe the sun has gone behind a cloud and it's not as sunny, uh, darker colors work as well. So black posts are also an option uh, as well. So hopefully you can see on that one, that's just going to give us a big old footprint, big body sticking through uh, the water. I will always grease up um, the hackle, uh, the hackle itself. So again, not a huge amount, just tiny, tiny sort of drop on my finger and thumb and I'll work it in. And again, make sure it's dry um, and prepped before you go. And again, then you can, you can, yeah, either fish it as it is, um, or you can tie um, a bit of tippet to the end. I usually go for on a small stream, depends how deep it is. If I'm fishing, it's kind of skinny. Then again, I'll, I'll generally go for a foot maximum of two, because again, that nymph can be flapping around and fishing drag free drift, really. So you're not going to see the takes if it's very long. So again, a foot. And again, you're just focusing and targeting on those little bin lids or, or car bonnets that I said earlier. So there you go. That's fly number one. Um, and that's probably the most convoluted fly of the lot tonight, um, just because of the, the the techniques needed. There's a couple in there. So there you go. Uh, that's the first one. So let me just do a bit of tidy up. Any questions on that one while I'm tidying up? No? All happy? Not very smart, right? Okay, okay, right. Next one's going to be a quick one. Uh, so let me take this out. Sorry, Gareth. Um, I have I have a question, but I'm not that fast. Uh, I'm muting myself. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, last time I was at the uh, Danish Fly Fair Festival. Uh, the Danish Fly Festival. I've been sitting next to uh, Hans Van Klinken. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we had a, a lot of chats. You know him. Uh, you 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 can talk the whole day and the whole night <laughs> and the next day again. Yeah, but I never asked him uh, where the idea came from tying a clink hammer, uh, or what kind of insect he wants to imitate, or which kind of uh, I'd say um, family he tries to imitate. So, what's what's your opinion about the clink hammer? I'll I'll try and get. There's a good um, article. It's it's pretty old now, as you can imagine, because this this is a that's an old fly, really. Or the clink hammer special, I think it was um, initially. He developed it with his mate, I believe, Han, uh, what's his name? Mr. Groot, I believe it was. Um, so, yeah, it was, it, and he ties them huge, right? Um, and he kind of jokes that um, if it's anything smaller than like a size 10, it's not a clink hammer. It's a, a curved body emerger, right? Um, yeah. uh, his are huge. I think I think I had one off him once uh, when he was at British Fly Fair a few years back. Uh, it was massive like it's not going to imitate anything on my waters but he designed it for big caddis hatches on scandinavian rivers grayling actually uh, it wasn't even for trout um so that's i'll try and dig that article out because it's always a good read and it does give you the history of the clink hammer special uh the materials he used um and a bit of the backstory then of how he came up and, and developed that fly because there's not many fly designers as such anymore are they uh, it's kind of all being done i mean i i've not designed anything uh, certainly I, i've fished you know imitations of, of of other um of other flies but um yeah i believe that's the backstory i'll try and dig that article out because it's, it's a decent read it's not long uh, but it's it's interesting well cool, thank you size six and size eight i seem to remember gareth six yeah can you imagine a size six clean camera that, that that's going to be like uh, that's a cigarette. <laughs> so I don't know what um, I don't know what grayling takes that, but uh, well, that's why some of the grayling out there are huge, right? They they must be eating on something big. Um, mm. And there we go. And I don't think he initially designed it to support nymphs because we've kind of no. caught on in the last what 15, 20 at a max. The whole New Zealand style clink and dink uh, duo. Um, you know that that's not been around. That wasn't around in the 80s, not, not that I know. Maybe the New Zealand guys were doing it. Um, but no, he wasn't. He just developed this hugely buoyant fly to uh yeah, just just float on these just these crazy um fast waters. And it obviously worked and it's become a household name now, obviously. So um yeah. Worldwide. <laughs> Worldwide, yeah, indeed. 
he told me he he used them also for um tropical fishing really yeah the big clank cameras yeah wow okay yeah i wouldn't um i wouldn't put it past him he's a he's a he's got so many interesting stories like you say uh you got talking to him and you you, you feel it by the end of the day <laughs> I, I also shared a room with him, so it was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a story for another night. Yeah. <laughs> Hope you will tell the tale. Uh, yeah, question? Yeah, uh, go back to the clink camera. Did you uh, varnish that? How did you finish it? Uh, I, I don't, um, personally. I don't use a lot. I, I, I do have varnish on my desk. Uh, I can't remember what patterns i use varnish but right yeah that's it if i'm using strip quill i'll do a drop of varnish underneath and that's probably the only time i use varnish the, the good thing with this uh gsp sample ply nano silk whatever you want to call it is when it when you tighten down because the, the the fibers of the, the the synthetic thread when you pull them down it, it almost kind of i wouldn't say it cuts into itself but it it kind of makes a ridge and this is why um that last bit when i was tying off under the feather to have to tie off the hackle if you go on with too tight a turn it will cut into itself it won't snap but it'll cut into itself and it'll stop you from drawing it back through and that's happened in in, in a few uh fly demos and i've kind of had to i don't know bullshit my way out of it to be honest um but yeah trust me you, you will need varnish with it Again and again, you've taken away uh, an extra um, material almost, right? So you, you, you're reducing that bulk. But yeah, as I say, it can be quite slippy. So one of the first things people say is, oh, I, I couldn't get on with that um, GSP nano silk. You keep going with it because the more you use it, you'll you'll understand the, you know, its strengths, its, I wouldn't say weaknesses, but its constraints uh, and where you need to maybe pull back on a bit of pressure. But for tying off, you can go out for that. You can really, you know, dig into it. One, you can see I tied off with three um, turns and then one underneath the hackle um, itself and then pulled through. Trust me, I've not had one, uh, I've not had a hackle splay or, or come undone. And certainly if you tie in behind the eye, then again, three, four turns, uh, whip finish and, and you're away. It, it's literally, it, you forget that you even need varnish anymore. I certainly not use varnish now for, 15 years I've been tying with this stuff um, and it's come from strength to strength. Um, the new stuff is, is yeah, it's game changer really. It's just good. If I may add something to it, um, yeah. if I, I use NanoSig a lot as well. And when I finish a fly, especially dry flies or even nymphs, I just add some uh, bee wax on the thread. And then if you pull it tight, it gets, I would say like a bit melted or hot yeah uh, the wax mm. and then it soaks up into it and then it cools down and then it's totally safe so locks in yeah. yeah totally locks in additionally to that stuff you told us good yeah that's a good idea yeah or uh so beeswax uh, if you want to use varnish it, when i used to i dip in my bodkin and then just just sort of wipe it along the thread and then do my whip finish. And again, maybe similar to what Alice was saying, that forms the, you know, and it dries, I suppose, as well. So, yeah, you've got a couple of options there then. Try it without, try it with beeswax, try it with, with varnish, see what works. Thanks, Gareth. So, uh, right, this one should, shouldn't take long. Um, this one's the, uh, right, so excuse me if... Uh, Anybody thinks I'm a, a convoluted tire? These are the materials, All right? So we've got uh, a back of a deer <laughs> uh, and a ton of uh, CDC. Uh, and Mr. Mr. Cooper does well um, off us fly dress as a British fly fair every year because he's the first stand I go to. And well, I wouldn't say I wipe out his stock, but I do take about four packs. And these get well. I tie so much uh, with so much CDC through the year. Um, and it's it's top quality. I mean, some of the times you, you're pulling this out of the bag, and the the the, the natural um, oils on it still are just just phenomenal. I only use the natural. Uh, if it's dyed, then you're going to be stripping all the all the good stuff away, really. Um, but then if you're using coloured stuff, it's not normally for um, the application that we're going to be doing. Uh, so I've got a good uh, bit of pelt here. It's going to be our wing. Um, 
So I'll cut that in a moment, uh, and then CDC for the body. So again, this is this is a really quick, um, nice and easy. Yeah, we talk about guide flies, right? So I'm going to take, and I'm not prepped this, so let me see if I can find an appropriate feather. It's a guide fly, so um, I very much have the opinion of that will do. Okay, so CDC, how awesome is that? All those little barbules, if you want to call them that. They've all got their own little tiny little fibers attached to them, all of which are going to move. They're going to trap little oxygen bubbles. There is, I don't know, there, there's material. I say I'm a, a hackle nerd or a rooster nerd, but I don't know. This stuff is just, it's changed my tying, certainly, and certainly changed my, my, my fishing. Um, it's just bomb proof stuff. So, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take the, the fluff off the end because I'm going to put my hackle pliers on there in a minute. Uh, and at the front, you can see I've just, just drawn back um, some of the fibers, right? So this is where I'm going to tie in. So I'm just going to just gonna pull those back, all right? Uh, I'm just going to draw them back with my, with my thumb. So holding that. Kind of jumped the gun there. Should have uh, mounted the thread a little bit, shouldn't I? But I'm just going to hold the, the, the feather in my hand. I'm just going to go on with my thread. And snip. And I'm just going to take this thread all the way back. Not worried about a tape bow with this fly at all. And I'm just going to take that back just to where it starts to turn. So this is for camera. I think this is a 14, might be a 12. Uh, but I tend to fish these in 14s and 16s. Um, for those who have seen my small flies demo, I think it's on YouTube still. Um, again, you can translate this down to maybe a 20. Mm, 22 is a bit of a push because the deer here as a wing um, doesn't really lend itself to those sizes, if that makes sense. Um, then you want to look at specific stuff. So, but this one, I'll tend to fish fourteen happily every day uh, and sixteens. That's because, of course, that's what's on my rivers, right? The rivers I fish. So, if you have uh, bigger caddis where you fish, time larger, nice and simple, right? Um, but there we go. So this one's I think a 14 for, for the video as well, just for the camera. So again, much like the last fly, I'm just going to take this, tease it up, and then move it under. Actually, I'm going to make that a little bit longer. So there's two things we're trying to do here by drawing these back. Okay. So the first bit, so all of these fibers facing forward is going to be uh, about this much of my body. And then naturally, when I start wrapping these around, it's kind of like a hackle, right? So it's going to splay around uh, the hook as I tie it around, like a traditionally wound hackle dry fly, right? But that's what we want, because we want all these nice nice fat, fat fibers there to splay, and we'll draw them back. So if you can imagine, they're just going to, um, we're going to have a nice um, tight bottom half of the abdomen. And from there up, we're going to have, legs and antennas and bits and you know all the ugly bits that a trout will say yeah that's food um so that's why i'm drawing those back okay so bear with me just a second so again i'm just going to feed that up and uh, over to my side okay and then i'm just going to move my thread just up because i want to keep a little bit of tension there and i'm just going to pull that all the way back Nice and tight, that'll do. I'm just gonna do one tight turn there and I'm gonna keep the tension on. I'm gonna go up and uh, good lock in wrap underneath those butt ends and I'm gonna bring forward. So kind of look how much bulk that's added to that, that butt end of the fly, nothing really, right? I'm gonna take my thread all the way up to where I'm going to tie my winging all right nice and simple this is splayed this has been in the sun a bit too long this thread i think 
Anyway, that's fine. We'll incorporate that. We'll say it's part of the flight. Um, right, hackle pliers. So I'm going to go in at the butt end. And I'm just going to wrap around. Now you can see, hopefully, as I start tying, as we said, that tight bit is going to be the bottom end of the flight. Now you can start to see a couple of these splaying, which is perfect, right? We want that nice, messy um, upper abdomen, lower thorax as we start to wrap around. Now as I get to the point where... I parted and drew back those fibers. You can see now we start to wrap them back, almost like you're tying a, a spider almost, right? You're starting to tease back those fibers. And again, don't worry about touching turns too much. Uh, there's a couple of guys, I think they've been North Wales actually. Um, they just say, yeah, just 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 open turns. And I've not noticed any difference in catch rate. Because again, what we're looking to get from this fly is a load of mess at the top. And again, this is all going to move. As I said, it's going to trap bubbles. It's just going to do all the stuff that we want an imitation to do just to make it look like I'm a mess. I'm easy prey. Come and eat me. And I'm just going to do one loose wrap over, sort my thread, and then I'm just going to tie this stump down. it all back i'm just gonna park my thread in front so i'm happy that's tied off enough if this comes and unravels later then you can laugh but that's fine so again buoyant tumbly water um uh, you might think that's a lot of these bits um uh, but again we're looking for something that's very buoyant and can withstand the flow or potentially fast flows of a fast turbulent bit of water right if I was tying this for like the main stem, we talk about the usk with larger bit of river, more slack of waters, fish generally hold in position and they'll follow a fly back for, you know, a couple of feet. They've got a lot of time to, to inspect it with the smaller stream fish. They've got, they can maybe drop back a foot and they've either got to take it smash and grab tactics, right? Gorilla warfare almost. They either grab it or they don't eat simple as that. And most times they'll grab it. Could be a twig. Uh, I've, I've literally, in the past, me and a mate have sat on the side of a river or above a pool, and we flicked in tiny little bits of, of, of um, you know, like a stick, uh, and they've, they've pecked at it, they've taken it, and then they've spat it out. And we've seen that happen. So it's, a, it's an amazing thing to see. So these little wild um, fish are really, look, if I don't eat that, it could be food, it might not be, but if I don't eat it, I might, uh, might have to go another couple of minutes before finding some food. And they will spit it out if it's not food. Let me just move some of this mess away. That's material number one. And then I'm going to take my uh, deer pelt. So bear with me a second while I snip off a bit of my throwing. So I kind of want a pinch of um the stuff right um you can see it's bending one way the feathers are all over the place and more importantly hopefully you can see all this fluffy stuff at the very base right so we don't want that because that's just going to water clog it that's the under fur that the animal uses for uh you know heat and warmth so i'm just going to tease that out you could you could buy one of these funky fandangle little combs if you want um i haven't got one so uh i just kind of tend to tease it out I find if you do just flap it about and naturally just teases out and then by grabbing the tips and blowing, um, hopefully you can see a bit on the end there. It just kind of teases itself out, right? And you, it doesn't take much work at all. Um, and that's the under fur gotten rid of. So that's, I don't know, little pinch, all right? And I take my... Um, hair stacker because I want it to look all nice and uniform because I'm that kind of guy. Um, bear with me a second. I'm going to make a little bit of noise. And we're good. Now, I think I think it might be Mr. Paul Sleeney um, who mentioned on one of the, the, the time videos that 
when you're tapping your, your, your hair stacker, do it in an angle because what that will allow it to do is one, it condenses all the all the fibers together, and it also aligns the fibers um, so they're all staying the same way. And I very much uh, um, agree with that. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a good technique there. So bear with me a second. That should do it. And like magic, we've got nicely stacked here. So I'm just going to go in and pinch grab that because I don't want it to realign. And then I'm just going to put this on top. And I, what I'm looking for here is this is a caddis, right? So caddis, um, length of the body just passed. I'm happy with that. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to sort of hold it there. And then I'm just going to change hands and just do that, right? So hopefully you can see the eye there. Now, there's a couple of ways of doing this. I know Paul is a big advocate of snipping and then tying. Um, I've never been that good at doing that. So <laughs> bear with me. So I do it um, this way. So I keep the tips on or the butt ends on, all right? But I've got a nice way of, of, of trimming them in a minute. So what I'm going to do is just take a bit of thread in. So I'm going to do, I'm just going to do a pinch and loop. Hopefully you can see that. Pinch a loop and then tension up. Okay, now you can see all of those start to splay. And as I mentioned, get used to your nano throat. You, you pull too hard and it all goes off uh, everywhere. Uh, I did snip a couple of pieces there. So I've gone once over and pulled up. Then I'm going to take about half of it. And I'm going to wiggle through. Again, this is all about security. Bring it back down. Then I'm going to bring the whole lot up. And I'm just going to do my a couple of loose wraps just to hold the tension and we're almost done. As I say, Paul's way might be a bit uh, more efficient and knowing Paul it probably is, but uh, he can give me a lesson on that one day. So I'm just going to bring all those butt ends forward and I'm just going to give that a snip. Again, follow follow the wing, right? Um, again, for the head there. Um, just tidy that up. Couple of pieces hanging there. Again, you can probably pull those as opposed to opposed to snipping them. And then what I want is to bring it all up. And again, just just work finished in. All right. And again, any butt ends left, you can you can pull those out. But this is the ultimate guide fly, right? So we've got essentially two materials, absolutely two materials. This is going to be buoyant as, right? It's uh, There's no getting away from that. This is one of the most durable flies that I know. And certainly if I'm fishing a new bit of water, more often than not, this will be, certainly in, in its time of year, this will be my go-to fly. And as I say, you can make them, you can overdress them for faster water, such as this one, or you can find down that initial CDC feather. You can pull out a couple of bits if you want. Um, but again, that will be, trout food every day of the week, um, guaranteed. And again, on the main stems, I will um, find that down slightly. So I'll use probably a little bit less wing uh, because it doesn't need the buoyancy and maybe a little less CDC. But for small streams, that is uh, certainly um, a go-to. So again, that's the CDC uh, and elk, okay? Any questions on that one? Gareth, do you... Uh prescribe to scissors all the time for GSP thread or does some people use a blade there's various lines of thought on it I think isn't there yeah um, I've seen guys use like a razor blade um, to be fair my scissors are I get them sharpened by that chap at British Life Fair every year um, and these are about 10 years old now um, and you can probably see a couple of nicks there actually I oh, know no, they're okay um, but yeah once a year they'll get raise it up so effectively I, I normally when i normally need to cut really close i go in with one side and i'll just touch the thread and it, it just yeah it just evaporates under it it's great yeah but, um, but yeah i do know guys that love using like they've got a load of bloody <laughs> razor blades on the desk and stuff but no i did, did, did do it once but um i find these scissors are, are great I and mean, they're nothing special i think what are these ones? Dr. Slick? But again, it's just the brand, isn't it? They're all the same these days, really, these. Mm. But these are just yeah. the razor, the razor-tipped ones. Really good. Yeah, you, that guy's just down the road from me. 
Is he? Yeah, well, I know he's he's a busy boy at British Fly Fair, isn't he? So uh, I think he does uh, hairdresser scissors by tree, doesn't he? Hairdresser scissors, garden shears, you name it. If it's got a blade, it works like a scissor. Yeah. yeah. So, well, I think he's got to know his stuff because I think the um, some of the hairdresser scissors he mentions are like, they could be a grand. <laughs> so they're, you know, high quality bit of kit, those. Yeah. So you, can't, you can't mess them up. So, yeah. Thanks for that, Gareth. No worries. Pleasure. Right. Uh, we'll deviate slightly on the next one, and um, I'll get a chuckle out of a couple of you, I'm sure, in a second. Um, pop this in the voice. Look at that thing. <clears throat> a tungsten bead. Who would have thought Gareth Lewis tying an info? But um, there we go. Um, so we've tied the clink hammer. Um, so kind of wanted to, should have followed up really with that. This is the next one. So um, this is a size uh, 14, but normally I'll use a 16, right? Uh, this one's a 2.8 bead, but if I'm tying a 16, then it'll probably be like a 2 mil or I don't know, a 2.3. I, I don't really go into the, the bead magic that some other guys do. They know these things by diameter and, you know, individual bead weight and all that type of stuff. What I want is a quick, sharp guide type style pattern it's going to get into a little pocket and it's going to sink just enough that um, I can see my clink hammer move when uh, a trout eats it. All right. That, that, that's all I get, kind of care about with this. When it gets into like, you know, the Euro style nymphing and whatnot, th then I get that, you know, these guys are looking into it almost scientifically with, you know, how fast they get down and how slim the body is and that type of stuff. But with the small stream fishing, I think this is a kind of in between between that almost competition style fishing and um you know just fishing another level of the column all right which is what i'm looking to do so this allows me to do that so if it's a particularly tough day uh start of the season generally um then i might eventually use an imp um but generally you know from from april on so from mid-april on usually things have warmed up enough so you know, even in like two foot of water, a trout's going to come up for a dry fly usually, um, as long as I haven't spooked it. And that's generally the the challenge, right? Not so much the fly as um, I'll keep going back around to. So um, I'll just go on with my thread just behind the eye a second. Again, I'll just take it back to the bead. And so I use. <laughs> Where needed, I will use one of two nymphs. And generally, that's dictated by the closest one or the first one I see in my box. They're all the same size. Um, I don't tend to fish them very often on the main stems because, I'll, as I said, I'll sit and wait. Uh, and I'll generally wait for either a hatch to start or really, if even if the hatch has started, if there's no trout rising, then I generally won't make a cast because I know there's trout there, but and they will come up eventually. But I'll uh, wait and... Yeah, the dry fly game is for me. But start of the year, things are slower, things are colder. I might need to get the food right in front of the, the trout's face. And this is where I'll, I'll use that. So it's either uh, a pheasant tail nymph, nice and simple. Again, we talk about, you know, non-convoluted flies uh, that do the job, um, size, silhouette, all that good stuff. And then a hazier. So this one's going to be a hazier. Um, and I'll tie it the way I was kind of brought up tying it. Again, nice and simple materials, right? Um, so we're gonna have partridge tail. Again, you can use, you can use anything you want, really. <laughs> you can use uh, uh, CDC uh, or CDL rather. Um, anything as a tail, really. Find it on the riverbank tied up there if you want to. Um, so we've got um, a pre-prepped, um, Partridge feather, color and important. Uh, this one's from a pack called Brown, but uh, you can see it's a bit it's a bit lighter than that. Uh, the tips are a bit brown, but um, it's a bit more gray. Don't care. I just want something that that's going to give the indication of a tail. But what I do like about Partridge, as you can see, is that mottled sort of color there. So it's not as sort of finely marked as um, Coq de Leon. Um, I like, I use a lot of cochlear for tails, um, but for, as it's the gold red here's year, right, uh, I think this is probably one of the the, the originals, but you use what you want, it, it is fine. Um, we've got, obviously, um, 
Cold Wire for the rib, which also adds a little bit of weight, not much. We, we've got a tungsten bead on the top, so that's going to that's gonna give us the main weight. Um, I've got haze mask for the body and the thorax. And then just to give us a bit of flash, we've got this uh, Mirage flash, which I'm going to use as a, a thorax cover almost, um, again, which is going to give us a little bit of flash. The bead is going to give as well. Um, this one's a nickel bead. Um, when I do use nymphs, I kind of go for nickel. I just like the way it looks. It's not too like gaudy and jewelry ish, um, but it it gives us weight and it kind of adds to the drab dull effect of of what I'm trying to tie. Um, not said on use gold, but again, it, much like the when I uh, go to choose a nymph. I think it's the same with beads. I had the same bulk batch of beads for years, and I just go into the same bag, and they're generally nickel. So you use what, what again, what you want. I know there's advocates as well for silver. Um, the new colored beads. I think Ian Gillard does some awesome different types of color. Um, but yeah, you you use what you want, right? So I'm just gonna do um, again, much like the clink hammer or any kind of fly eye tie. Um, I like a nice tapered carrot like body right and again or not again sorry um what i'm trying to achieve for this as well is to lock that bead in place uh, i don't want it slipping back or ideally um spinning around once i finish the fly so again this this all adds to adds to that initial setup of the fly so again i'm just going to go around to uh the curve not too far you use a straight hook for this if you want I'm just using a, a curved hook, uh, just a general grub hook. Um, just going to separate the fibers. We don't need many. So good. So the difference is then, I suppose, you might say, well, why don't you use Coctelion? Um, again, we're using this just, just because it's the gold ribbed here, and it was initially tied with the partridge. Uh, it can be brittle, so you might lose a couple of, of feather fibers. So that's generally when I might opt actually for Coctelion because it's a bit more resilient. Uh, so I've just parted those and I've just, you can see I've I've splayed them back. So ideally what I'm trying to do there is, is align the tips. And again, what I'll try to do is, is kind of what I do with all my um, tails is go generally same size tail for the same size body. Now this is a nymph, so technically the tails are going to be slightly smaller, right? So I might tease those back so that they're a little bit shorter than the body. It's not a done, it's not a, certainly not a spinner. So these, these, if you look at the vertebrates in, in the water itself, uh, the tails are always a lot shorter. Again, just catch those down. Notice I've not snipped off yet because I'm incorporating that into the taper of the body, right? And again, I'll cut close to the head or the bead. Wouldn't you hear me saying that very often, but there we are. There we go. And there's my tails. Okay. Nice and simple. So again, I'll just focus for a second on building up uh, a taper and I'll add the wire in a second, which is going to continue adding to the taper. So bear with me a second. I'm going to pull off a decent amount because we're going to use this on the next flight. Ooh. Right, I snipped that with my scissors. Now, some of you may gasp in, in, in horror. When I cut um, wire, which is very rarely because I don't use a lot of it, I always cut at the very bottom uh, or the back of the blade. So, you know, when I'm going in and I'm snipping my dainty little dry flies, then I'll use the snips. When I go in with wire, it's at the top. So, again, I'm not ruining those fine tip points. So that's something that uh, I was taught years ago. And it's always stuck and save me some money on on wires uh, on 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 scissors. So I'm just going to feed that into the bead. I don't know if you can see that. It's on my side, um, not so that it goes so far forward, but I want it to sort of sit inside the bead. Okay. And again, I'll just tie that back, touch and turns, all the way to the. Or just before actually the, the the last thread on the on the body on the butt let me just uh, see if i can make that a little bit sharper 
We hope. Uh, okay, so again, you can use Superfine, you can use Hey the Year, you can use what, what uh, whatever you want. I've got a mix here of um, Hey's Mask and Hey's Year, which I've shaved off um, with a hair trimmer. It's not the same one I use for my head. You might uh, be happy to know. Uh, and again, I, I'm just going to start to create um, a dubbing rope noodle. And again, what I want is for the butt end to be a little bit skinnier than where I'm going to end up behind the bead or the thorax, I'm sorry. So I'm just going to tie that on, lift that up. I'm just going to do uh, one wrap and again, or, or two rather, I need two. I'm just going to tease some of that out because again, I want that butt end nice and tight. Okay, uh, exactly like the clink camera, I'm just going to bring it up. And it's, again, I'm just going to inspect my work as I go. Just make sure that I'm forming that nice carrot or taper. And again, where needed, I can add a little bit more. suppose this is where the, uh, the pheasant tail is a little bit quicker and easier to do because you're not messing around with the dubbing. You've just got a couple of fibers, but that really does need a, a rib because it can be quite uh, quite fragile sometimes. Get a trout tough on it and it can it can splay, but again, if you tie it right, it shouldn't. Uh, almost there. Bear with me, folks. Okay, so that's about where I want to stop because I want to, again, we want a thorax, right? Now this I am, I'm not going to trim. Um, it's going to stop the descent of the fly. But again, because I'm fishing small streams, I'm not fishing deep, deep, deep pools. You know, I'm not fishing um, like a French leader outfit. I'm not trying to get down deep. What I'm trying to do is get into that maybe top foot because as this, this, this is moving through the water, it's not fishing vertical, for example, off the tippet or the hook bend of a clink hammer. It's always going at an angle. Um, so I'm not worried about it fishing deep, but I am, what I'm trying to do is get it down to, you know, maybe touch the river bed or, and, and that could only be like a foot or so below, right? So I'm not too, too worried. So I'm just gonna come forward then with my rib in, in uh, with counter turns. So I'm going the opposite way around the hook shank now. Uh, and again, open turns. And if you want, you can make these segments wider as you come up the body, like the naturals are. And again, I'll just park that there and I'll just give it a couple of turns and then I'll tie it off. Again, I won't cut this, I'll just wiggle and it, off it comes. Again, we'll brush that back. And I do like a, a, a hazier to be nice and spiky, actually. Um, it does give a lot of movement um, or, or more, I wouldn't say footprint because it's not on the water surface, but it does give a bigger sort of um, shape to the to the pattern, right? So again, this is ideally something which is which is maybe ascending in the water that's trying to hatch. Again, I'm not, I'm not too worried about looking into that. Um, this one is it's more of a uh, an, an all and everything pattern, right? Much like a pheasant tail, you know. I've never seen a hatch of pheasant tails. Um, so for this one, we're going to take our flash. Okay, I'm just going to again, uh, much like I've done with a few of the other bits, I'm just going to take that and uh, I'm just going to draw it back. I'm just going to make sure that's sat right on top of the hook shank. Let me just double look. You can nudge it over if need be. And again, we've got enough there now for, let me just um, park that in my material holder, whatever it's called. 
Now, uh, for the thorax, yeah, you could do like split thread if you want it to be really spiky. But again, these are, you know, quick, nasty, well, not nasty, but quick and dirty flies. Um, again, I just want a bit of all or nothing um, as a nymph. And again, nice and nice and quick to tie, right? If I wasn't talking through each of this, it'll be, it would just be bash them out. Again, you can be a bit looser with your dubbing on this one. You see, it's gone a bit spikier. And if you wanted to, you could um, tease out some of those those those, those feathers as, or fibers as well. Squirrel is quite good for this because it will be quite spiky. So again, I'll just draw that through. And we'll pull that forward. Again, just make sure that's sat upright. Again, not too much pressure with the with the thread, otherwise it'll cut through. So I'm just going to do a couple there, then draw it back. And then I'm just going to do a nice whip finish in front. And I'll pull tight. That should disappear under the, under the bead. Just pull that back and then snip. And then if you wanted to, you can pick out some of the, the thorax. If you want to make it a different color, fine. Um, up to you. But again, this is, as I say, a, a quick um, guide fly almost that gives us a bit of flash, um, some nice buggy um, sort of body, and again, um, a thorax in there uh, as well. So again, just a quick um, gold ribbed hazy almost, not like the original, but again, um, nice, simple fishing fly. Right, any questions? We're coming up to nine. We've got, uh, so I'll do five, um, we'll do the fourth, um, but if we've got time or anybody wants to stay on, we can do the fifth if you really want to. Right then, so. Um, a couple of yeah. quick questions. What sort sure. of what, uh, maker hooks are you using? Uh, what's your bobbin holder? Because GSP, don't you need to use um, uh, the lined ceramic? Good question. So these are, and I, I think I bought these from Lakeland a million years ago. Um, if you can see the the top there, this is this is a Renzetti. Um, this is a ruby tipped. <laughs> Go figure. Um, oh, there's a bit of red there, but yeah, ceramic works fine because again, the GSB can kind of cut into the brass uh, or metal quite easily. I've used um, GSBs and, and nano silks with this bobbin holder. This one is about, I don't know, I'd say almost 20 years old. I don't know. Um, still going. I've got three of them. Uh, they're long-nosed, um, if you can see the length of that. So where the handle is, it's quite long. You can really get in tight. Um, I love them. Um, but I think Lakeland's always out of stock, so I don't know when and where you can get them from. But, um, yeah, they're, they're fantastic. Uh, was there another question? So um, just if I swap cameras, that's the that's the bobbin holder. The older model came with like a, a plasticky, uh, almost rubber wrap around it. Um, this one comes with brass. That's a little bit oh. newer. This one's even older. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, just what, what uh, brand and make of hooks are you using? Uh, traditionally partridge. Um, so as long as it's a good, strong um, hook, I always look for good strong wire but the gauge of the wire itself needs to be um thin enough so there's loads of good ones out there um this one happens to be a tmc the fuller mill ones are really good um partridge are fantastic the sld twos are pretty much bomb proof um yeah there's, again it's going back to the uh points i made earlier about you know what how good materials are these days there's so much to choose from but between yeah, you've got your full of mill, you've got your, your TMC, which are quite hard to get hold of now. Shipments, uh, again, a bit um, problematic. So either between full of mill or partridge are, are, are banging. Uh, RX stuff is really good. Um, that's another good one. I think Sprite is kind of half up the press the last few years. Uh, I don't tie a lot with Sprite, but um, yeah, that partridge, uh, full of mill and TMC um, until the stock goes. Any other questions? Hopefully that answers that one. Right. So 
last one for a second. Um, this one's the direct. So we talked earlier about the the animal, <laughs> uh, and this one's a cork and a half, right? So again, nice strong hook for this one because trout will absolutely try and kill the thing. Um, again, it's another one of those patterns that um, just seems to bring them up. I don't know really what it is. Um, so there's a couple of um, a couple of ingredients in this one. One we've got the head essentially. And the tail, which is deer here, you can use elk if you want. Um, we've got hackle running along the body. Uh, we've got a rib through it, and then obviously we've got the end of body, which yeah, you I use uh, like a as I said, you see in that um, um, photo earlier that it's this I think it's a rusty orange blend of snowshoe rabbit foot dubbing and here's you. So again, quite buoyant in its own right, but again, it's the hackle that's going to give us that, I suppose. So let me find. The bits I need. I'm stabbing myself in the finger with a hook. Mm -hmm. So um, with this one, um, we're going to lay a sec. Effectively, we're going to tie in a deer here at the front, and then use that as the underbody all the way back, and then form a tail. Right. So because um, we don't want that to slip around the hook, we need a, a effectively a um, yeah, an underbody, or, or at least laying a, a layer of thread so that um, that has something to grip on. So bear with me just a moment. Uh, next up is our deer here. Again, we don't want a huge amount of this, again, because the, the buoyancy is going to come from our hackle, right? So I'm just going to probably use a little less than what I used for the uh, CDC elk. So give me just a moment. So same again, I'm just going to blow out the under fur. You could use your, um, I don't know what they're called, defluffing comb, I don't know. Um, I don't have one of those, as I say. So um, uh, I've got my piece there, so bear with me a moment. I'm just going to this time be a bit more well-mannered. I'm just going to go on mute while I bang it. So. Neighbours probably won't enjoy that, being nine o'clock, and it sounds like I'm doing DIY, but here we go. Okay, so this one's a little bit more uh, fiddly. Okay, so I've aligned my tips. Okay, I want the tail to sort of go past the body, uh, but not too far. So now what I've got to do is this, this is where the tail is going to end. All right. Uh, maybe a bit shorter. So I've got to hold that in place and then do um, a loose wrap over the top and then I'll tighten down uh, over the top. Okay. Now I'm trying, what I'm trying to do is keep that body straight. And I'm going to come back and tie that in open turns all the way back to the butt. And that one, I kind of want to put some loose straps on. And I don't want it to splay too much. Okay, that's about as, as, as much as I'd like. Yeah, well, what you come. It's better. So I'm just going to come back in. Again, you can see I'm, I'm almost forming like a, like a detached body almost, right? Um, like one of these mayflies, but... Um, Again, I'm not putting too much pressure on because I don't I don't want that to to splay. Oh, sorry to uh, to cut through. Sorry, that's what I should say. And then we can tidy the head up, right? So this can be a bit bit of a messy fly, or or certainly fiddly to start with. So I'm just gonna bring that forward. I'm just gonna sort the butt ends out. Park my way through mid. So this time I'm just going to tease these forward and then I'm going to give it a nice cut there. And where needed, we can trim off any stragglers. And just behind the head, what I'm going to do now is incorporate uh, my ribbon. So what we're going to do, we're going to do a palmered um armored hackle and as we know with any palmered it 
generally needs a bit of security, right? Otherwise, it's uh, it could snap when you get a truck tooth on it. And we want truck tooth on it, but we want to get a couple of fish off it. Um, so hackle wise, so I'm just gonna come up again. I can be I can be quite um, what's the word? I can be quite heavy handed with my um, hackle. Uh, sorry, my thread because I'm using a really thin but strong thread, right? So I'm gonna really gonna worry about um too many turns so i can lay a good body if i wanted to um just to make sure that's nice and even and no lumps and bumps right so uh hackle i've got a nice cree here Ooh, you will see um so i'm just gonna again strip down the end i'm just gonna tie this on um, my side so i'm just gonna what i did earlier exactly the same I'm just going to bring that up and, uh, and around. I'm just going to park that on my side. And I'm going to tie that um, stalk rigus all the way. The problem with these, um, these lengthy fibers or these lengthy feathers is they can get away the bobbin. So bear with me. Right, so feather one side, rib the next, because we're going to go, um, effectively, we're going to um, move it um, sort of um, backwards. Actually, what I'm going to do, bear with me one second. What I did wrong, for the eagle eye among you, tie it in the wrong way, because we are going to be palmer hackling this. So this needs to be tied shiny side facing the body. Okay, so again, let me just uh, take some thread off. Tie this one in. Again, if it's a long feather, I just move that out of the way. Okay. Just get that snip. Take all this all the way down. Like that. And then we'll just go in with some dubbing, right? And again, it can be um, any color that you want, really. Again, I, I, I quite like this orange because it, it, it gives me a little bit more of a visual um, when I'm fishing out on the water. Um, you don't need to. Again, if you're fishing water that's not that broken, then you don't really got to worry about it. But um, again, the faster um, white flecked broken water, then the color can help. Uh, but I don't tend to worry about color in many other situations. And again, don't worry about being too heavy handed with the dubbing, because again, what we don't want to do is put a, a material in that might um, take a lot of water on. That makes sense because uh, again that's just gonna add more weight and stop the the buoyancy which again it's gonna be hard to fight against with this pattern because as i say it's like a cork and again this dubbing is a, a mix of hazier and snowshoe rabbit foot so uh, again it's kind of naturally buoyant out of the pack so again uh, any body i tend to turn the fly just to see it's all looking nice and uniform. Almost there, folks. There we go. All right, so uh, let me take off a bit. Park that behind the head. I'm just going to do so. The length of this this feather, I like it to be around about the the, the gape of the hook. Otherwise, it just kind of sits a little. Um, well, it doesn't sit as well as it could put it that way. Um, but there's a trick in a second that I'm going to do. Um, so again, open turns, or ideally uniform open turns, Gareth. Again, don't don't worry about um, 
too densely hackling this. I've seen some that have been on this size fly. It could be just one or two, well, not one or two, but four or five turns maybe. So again, we've palmed it. Um, we've got our rib. So now I'm going to counterwind and wiggle as I come through, and that's going to add a nice bit of security to the fly. Again, we don't want to trap any of the hackle fibers down, so just be careful as you wiggle through. And then just behind the head, I'm just going to give it one turn, two turns, maybe a third, and then brush everything up again and then finish under the eye. So I'm not going to snip anything just yet. One, two, three, and a fourth. Again, nice tight pull. And then with my scissors, make sure I have misplaced. Where have you gone? There they are, right from me. Uh, as Mr. DeVille was, was saying, um, so I just tend to go in with one uh, blade. And then again, you can show these <laughs> blades do it and they just uh, break off. So again, much like the other one, I'm just going to wiggle my um rib and then go in again with the scissors and just slice and away we go that's almost it now you could fish it like that yeah that's that's pretty um brutal right um there's a lot going on there it looks more like a caterpillar I think, than than anything else um but that buoyancy wise is going to give you a lot um hopefully you can see that um, but what I think um, a lot of the guys do, and I think the original is, we'll go in with our scissors underneath. So again, I'm, I'm bracing with my thumb. And then horizontally, I will snip the entire length of the fly. So give me a second. So effectively, we've now got a flatter underneath. So that's going to sit in the same way every single time. And again, it's going to be absolute cork all right so you, i think um there's also the super pupa which um is, is kind of cut along the top as well but again it doesn't have the deer here um this as i say it's is it's a pretty quick fly right there's like what one two three four ingredients so there's a few things going on there but i guarantee you that that will not sink that's just an awesome fly you can also it also support um a, like a, a nymph underneath as well um this one's a size 14 um, so again, that's pretty much my go-to. If again you, you're fishing a faster, more broken piece of water, then um, again you know up the size if needed. Uh, again, it's, as long as it's visible, buoyant, and gives a, a bit of a mess. This this is you to incorporate or or in, imitate um, Addis as well. So again, um, Scandinavian Addis get huge hatches there. Um, works as well on, on the small streams that, that I fish, certainly. And again, it's another one of those um, patterns that's like a clink hammer, really. It just tends to, to bring them up. And again, I'll, I'll fish it by uh, greasing up the hackle um, and the tail. And again, away you go. If you find you do get a bit of spin on your tippet, then again, you can either up the, the diameter of your tippet, um, because again, you're fishing small streams. I tend to fish uh maybe a 5x what's that five pound because again i'm going to be worried about trees and snagging things right so that again will minimize that um tippet spin because this is like a propeller right there's, there's a lot of propellers on here in fact um that's one if you find you're still getting it then um next time you, you, you're at your tie-in bench then um, open up those turns of hackle a bit more so they're wider apart. So I did, so essentially less hackle turns. So again, that will minimize the spin as well. Um, but again, that's the one caveat with this pattern. It can, can give you a bit of, of tippet twist, so to speak. Um, so that was the four. Um, we're over nine, so I'll probably call it there. As I, as I say, you don't need much more in my eyes. Um, in terms of um, what you use on a small stream. Because, as I say, if we come back to what we said at the start, they are highly opportunistic, and I say they, the fish. Um, 
they're going to be smash grab guerrilla warfare um, tactics. So again, they'll they'll nail it before worrying whether it's food or not. They'll make that decision afterwards um, and either spit it out or, um, uh, or or just continue to swallow it. Right. So, uh, yeah, that's the four. So we did the clink hammer. Uh, we did a nymph, which you can yeah, you fish on its own. You can fish it on the main stems if you want. But nice and simple, um, hazier variant um that can be fished underneath the clink if you want the cdc and elk generic um guide style sedge pattern um again by hans van oh, hans Weilman, sorry um again fantastic you can play around with um which way the wing is tied in because if you tie the other way around so it faces forward more like a shuttlecock that's hans Weilman's um cdc and elk cripple which please do tie because it's fantastic. I use that quite a lot on um, on the River Ask. Uh, what else was there? The direct or the animal um, from Norway. Um, that, in my eyes, is all you need for fishing a small stream. Um, the biggest challenge is keeping your profile low. So where you can uh, and where my knees don't hurt, because they do after a day on a small stream, try and stay low. The casting that you're going to be doing is more often than not not going to be overhead it's going to be side casts because once you know april may come along and those um generally where i'm from the alders um or sycamores more often than not will completely cover um make a ceiling of of of, of trees and, and leaves so you're going to be casting unfortunately on the side so i I'd, I'd recommend that you know you use that another good thing is um Early season, you can kind of get away with longer rods. So I use a nine foot for a four weight, you know, my my usk rod, essentially, early season, because the trees are bare, so I can get away with it. And that time of year, as I've said, where I might opt to use a nymph, that longer extension of the rod will allow me to get the nymphs into the, you know, uh, a little bit further away from me without having to worry about fishing a duo. Um, general time of year then from, well, generally April on, then I'll switch to my proper proper small stream rod and that's a seven foot six two weight um and again that just does it all and i'm generally fishing dry flies at that point so the two weight is fine uh it does struggle a little bit when you stick an in one even that six, size 16 um well that's a 14 by 10 to use 16s uh, it does struggle a bit you certainly feel the weight so you need to slow things down quite a bit but again that's when the side casts the roll casts come in and generally where there's foliage or leaves and tree branches a double haul helps as well or certainly a haul on the delivery because then you're tightening and reducing the, the 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 height of that loop, so you can really get in and under um, branches. So again, but now and again, you know, uh, no one's perfect. Um, I lose loads of flies when I fish um, small streams, because again, you've got to get those flies in some of these places. You're thinking these trout just want to make my life hard, um, but yeah, it, it's all good fun, and it's uh, well, that's not good fun. It's, it's great fun, right? So yeah, uh, hopefully, I've shown you a couple of patterns today hopefully we had a good chat um mm. before we call it any any questions everyone's quiet <laughs> no I, I i have uh, no question i have only a, a suggestion gareth mm -hmm. keep on doing the stuff you do originally like you did right now it was a good storytelling nice flies super hard skills uh, very nice. Thank you, buddy. Yeah. No, always a pleasure. Thank you. I'm always looking for feedback as well. So uh, keep coming. <laughs> if you'd rather yeah. message me personally, then uh, feel free. But uh, yeah, thank you all uh, as always. Thank you. But I'll see you before. Enjoy the rest of the season. Uh, have a good winter, and hopefully uh, we'll see you all in Stafford in February. So thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks, Gareth. Thanks, Gareth. See you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.